World War I would be the war that forever changed the battlefields of the future. With a variety of vehicle types, such as aircraft and tanks, that would see its first deployment in relatively large amount of numbers on the battlefield. With this war also would see the increased usage of radios and wire telegraph sets, which allowed for speedy communications between the different units on the battlefield, allowing for greater unit coordination across longer distances. With both sides of the war using these tools extensively, the war had devolved into a bloody one that would never be forgotten. With the Western Front turning into miles and miles of trench warfare, where often armies will lose thousands of men to capture a single trench line 400 meters away, only then to be pushed back from the trench line within the same day. On the Eastern Front, the trench systems weren't as developed compared to the Western Front, as the war on the Eastern Front was of a more mobile nature, that saw the large use of horse cavalry, as the operational range on the battlefields on the Eastern Front were much larger. But the trenches proved nonetheless difficult for the Russian army to break through the defensive lines. Attempts would be made to make a vehicle that can travel over no man's land and pass over the trenches. That was impossible for the current vehicles to achieve. This would invariably lead to the famous example of the British Mark IV tank. But Russia had made an attempt at making a vehicle one year prior before the first build deployment of the tank. The Tsar tank also known as the Lebedenko tank, in honours of its creator, Nikolai Lebedenko. A rather bizarre vehicle that was indicative of the 1910s, with experimentations on creating new designs of vehicles, as well as entirely new concepts, with the British Mark IV setting the marker of future designs of tanks. The story of the Tsar tank began in 1914, with Lebedenko, who designed the tank, along with help from other people, such as Nikolai Shukovsky, a man that would be known as the father of Russian aviation, Alexander Mikulin, who would be the designer for various aircraft engines that were used by the Soviets and Boris Sergeyevich Stenkin, the co-developer of the first four-engine bomber, the Sikorsky Ilya Mamonets. A spring-powered model of the Tsar tank was made and eventually presented to the Tsar of the Russian Empire, Nicholas II, who was intrigued as the model tank was able to climb over some thick books that had been laid out in front of the model with the books in question being the Code of Laws of the Russian Empire. It then gave the project the go-ahead on the funding of the tank, which is partly the reason why it is called the Tsar tank, in honour of its sponsor, Nicholas II. The project was then started, but one of the things that was quickly understood about the eventual prototype is that the vehicle would be extremely heavy as a result of the size of the tank. Suffice to say, it made it impractical to be fully assembled at the factory, and so the Tsar tank would have to be assembled near the battlefield where the tank would be deployed. The prototype was then completed in mid-1915, which was actually quite fast for the construction of the Tsar tank, but this was due in part to the massive amount of funding for the project of around 250,000 rubles. The prototype Tsar tank was massive, with the size of the vehicle being 18 meters in length, 12 meters in width, and 9 meters in height, with the size of the two front wheels measuring at around 9 meters in diameter. The main power plant of the Tsar tank will be two Maybach engines delivering 240 horsepower per engine. 
with the total output being 480 horsepower combined, which was relatively quite large amount of horsepower for a vehicle at the time. When the prototype was finished in 1915, it had weighed around 60 tons, which was actually 50% overweight from what was originally calculated. This was due to the use of much more thicker materials, something that would come to bite them back in the future. In regards to the armaments of the tank that would be equipped on the SAR tank, it is not exactly known what guns were going to be mounted on the tank. We do know at the very least machine guns would be mounted on the central fighting compartment. That is confirmed, whilst on the sponsors, information on what would be mounted there isn't clear, whether it be more machine guns or, according to speculation, that 3 inch guns could be mounted onto the sponsors. But since the prototype wasn't mounted with any guns, we could never know what would be mounted on the production models of the tank. After the completion of the prototype, the SAR tank was then tested at a proofing grounds located 16 miles away from Moscow. The tests began with the SAR tank moving at a slow but steady 10 km per hour, running over small trees that stood in its path. But as the tank started moving across softer terrain, the back wheels sunk into the ground and subsequently got stuck, whilst the two front wheels propelling the tank kept on digging further into the ground. This was due in part to the centre of mass being more focused on the rear section of the tank, which was the flaw that they have no chance in correcting. Attempts were made to recover the tank, but all failed. The tank would later be abandoned and the project was subsequently shut down, as the main problems of the tank would dawn on any sane commander that a large vehicle such as the SAR tank would not only be a logistical nightmare to transport, assemble and then move into battle, it would also be a very vulnerable target thanks to the size of the tank, and as a result, it would be an easy target for the enemies to fire upon with artillery shells. Plus you also had the climate and terrain on the Eastern Front often being either soft or boggy in most places which would make it impossible for the massive tank to operate in. The prototype was subsequently left to rust where it was abandoned and in 1923 the SAR tank was then eventually scrapped. Thanks for watching and I hope to see you in the next one. Have a good day.